Hi, I'm Sarah Mee. I've been sewing on an industrial sewing machine for a really long time, and I've had Jukies for the last probably 20 years, I want to say, and or maybe a little bit more actually. <laughs> but uh, and uh, this may apply to lots of other machines. Today, I'm going to show you how to thread your machine, wind the bobbin, change the needle, maintain it, fill the oil, open up the um, tilt back your machine head. Um, give you tips on moving your machine if you are going to be moving and I'll also talk a bit about the difference between one with and without electronics but I do have another video that goes kind of into the nitty-gritty of that and it's the one where I race the home sewing machine versus the industrial with electronics and the ele industrial without electronics so you can kind of see the nitty-gritty of what makes those different uh, you pretty much only need, the only unique tool you're going to need today is this little screwdriver that has the divot on top unless you have something similar because you need to put it under the machine head and it's kind of a tight spot but you do want to be able to open that throat plate up. So the machines I'm going to be covering today and doing all this work on is the Juki 8700-7 which is this one. It's about a year and a half old for me and then my much much older one that is the previous version of this, the 50 550-6 um, but that one doesn't have electronics on it anymore so I think one of those numbers would be different if it didn't have the electronics on it but it does have the motor still and it still works so I'll show you that uh, I'll show you how to do a few other little adjustments on your machine as well and I hope I didn't miss anything let me know in the comments and I'll try and answer any questions I hope this helps you don't be afraid of your industrial embrace it try things out just go slow I know going slow on industrial doesn't seem like it's possible, but it is. You're really going to get the hang of it, I promise, and you're never going to look back. All right, let's do it. Okay, I'm going to insert this little um, little ditty, um, like past the intro and before all the good stuff. Um, I just want to preface this by saying I am not an expert in industrial sewing machines. I'm an expert in using my industrial <laughs> sewing machine. And so you may see me say things that I'm just like, ah, I'm not really sure about that, but this is what I would do to learn more about that. Um, and always turn your machine off if you're doing things. Don't forget your machine is very quiet. It's really hard to tell when it's on, most likely if you have this kind of motor. Um, plenty of industrial machines, you can hear them when they're on. It's really nice to hear that because um, one thing that you might forget is uh, that even if you don't think you're gonna touch the foot pedal, if the wheel of your chair touches it and lifts up the front that is basically depressing the other end of it which you know makes your machine turn on so turn it off and wait a few seconds before you touch the foot pedal because there's still power going to it and so just be careful of that but like i said i'm not an expert in this i say experiment if you're really nervous to try something out like try one of the things turn the hand wheel and go stitch by stitch um, and another thing I wanted to say is you can adjust the speed of your machine. I've never done that, and I don't know if I can do that myself, but I know the speed of these machines is, is adjustable. And I talk about this in that other video where I race the machines because that old industrial is faster than this one, and it kind of caught me off guard. Um, I'm really used to this one, and this one's not slow by any means, but you will get used to it. I'm very confident that you're going to get used to it. Just try it on scrap fabric. Don't try it on something precious and just trust that you're going to know what to do. You're not going to sew yourself, I promise. I mean, if you do someday, you might, but I promise it's not that bad. <laughs> so um, just, you know, use your head and be careful. But um, hopefully there's something in here. There's a lot of information in this video. I'm sorry it's not like quickly edited um, so that it's really snappy um it was just more of a labor of love because i really love this machine and i know there's a lack of information out there so i hope this helps you please let me know if it does and if you have a question please drop it in the comment section and i'll try and help you out all right good luck okay so the first step for um, threading your machine is obviously you know putting your thread here on the thread cradle this right here and um coming up from the back to the front and then coming down to the machine. So you need to make sure that there's nothing catching on your thread and nothing obstructing this and um, that your thread's directly above. That will really help because any kind of drag on your thread will cause issues. My light is pushed down because it interferes with my lighting for my stream. 
All right, so once we have the thread up there in the cradle, we're going to come down here and go through this pin. And we come back. It's always harder than it looks. And then you do it again. Take the thread to the back and do it one more time, just like that. And then you're going to come to the front of the machine here. Okay, so then we're going to head to this little tension section here and this right here um, regulates the length of thread after you um, stop sewing and cut it um, but you should check the owner's manual for more on that because these machine machines vary between them and what you can adjust all right so we're going to go through this first hole here and then we're going to go through this tension disc right here and i'm going to hold some hold the thread back here to keep tension on it while i slip it in between those discs Keep it in there, like pull it, make sure it's still in there when you go through. And then go through this next hole down here. Little bits of fuzz really build up and prevent you from going through some of these things. So you can use compressed air to clean it. All right, so now we're going to go to the tension down here. And this little area is commonly misthreaded, so I think this is just the trickiest, but it's also the most fun to thread. So you're going to go right through here, and this you should be able to just poke it through there, like flossing. And then you're going to go through these two discs here. These are your tension discs. Go through, and I'm holding tension on the thread to get it firmly seated in there. Don't let that happen. And then you're going to um, go around the disc. So don't go through this hook yet around the disc like this and then let it come down into this little spring right here and now you're going to go under this hook here and back up through this hook here so now when you're threading your machine if um, your presser foot's down this can be a little bit too tight but there's a way to keep your presser foot raised when your machine is still off and it's right back here so right here, there is this little lever, and you can raise and lower your sewing machine presser foot just by using that, and it stays. It won't automatically come down. All right, so let's do this one more time. So we've threaded this area here, and now I'm holding tension on my thread. Go through that, down around these discs, and I slip it between these hook here and behind the spring. Come down on the spring, up through this hook, back through this hook. So that's the whole section there. So it's going down through this hook here, which look, it already fell out because I've been taking too long. It gets a little slack. So go through the tension disc around the spring. You'll get really fast at this, but most of the time you're probably gonna tie your thread off and pull it through, just like that. All right, you need all those steps there. This is your tension, and there's other things you can do with this, and this also adjusts, um, and you'll want to do that for um, different um, fabric weights and things. Check your manual. I'm going to link it in the description. All right, and so now we're going up to the thread take-up lever. Mine has a guard over it. I don't know if yours does. Go through, just like that. And I try and keep all this in check while I'm threading it. Usually if I'm re-threading my machine, something has um, happened, like it's not sewing very well anymore, and I'm needing to re-thread the machine. Either that or I'm just changing color. Or it's, no, not necessarily changing color, changing thread type. So if I'm switching to um, top stitch thread for maybe denim making, I'm going to probably not tie that off and pull it through sometimes because I'm trying to conserve the top stitch thread. All right, so now we just go into this hook here, just plop it in there, and then come down to your needle area here. And you're gonna go around this wire right here. Just go to the back of it like that. Through this hole, so this for me is the hardest thing to thread. Don't ask me why. All right, get it through there. And then you're gonna go through your needle. My needle threads left to right. Most likely yours does too, if you have this model. And um, let's put the presser foot down so I have a little more space there. 
All right. I always put my thread through the foot and under it. I prefer to sew that way and I find it is a most helpful. Now, what are these things down here? So right here, Right here you have your um, screw to change your needle and then the screw to change your presser foot is located on the left of the presser foot here. Um, these are definitely not quick changes like they are in some home machines. You'll definitely want to change your needle often. Um, you probably cringe <laughs> thinking about how much I do it, but I do do it for every few hours of sewing. And um, I do feel my needle after I take it out, just feel if it feels a little bit rough. If I feel that roughness very consistently all the time, it's probably time to get it checked because their timing might be off or it's rubbing on something underneath. So it's something to kind of pay attention to. Now this right here is called a thread wipe or swipe. And what happens is it will move the thread out of the way. I don't have it enabled, but I'll show you in a little bit how it works. Okay, so um, you don't ever, I don't ever open this right here to do my bobbin. I always reach under the machine and you're gonna get really good at this. Your hand's gonna go right to it. Okay, so here's our bobbin. And if you're new to a uh, bobbin with a bobbin case like this, a removable bobbin case, this little lever holds your bobbin in there, <laughs> usually. Hold your bobbin in there and um, then you can place it under the machine and not worry about dropping it, just hold it firmly. All right, so here, is your bobbin and you're going to wind it like put it in here so that it's winding clockwise and I put the thread at the top and then I place it in the bobbin case slip it into this slot I'm holding the bobbin here so that it's not just pulling and then getting it hooked into there and that's all you do all right and so let's talk a little bit about the bobbin case so you can adjust the tension of the thread going through the bobbin case. This is a tension disc right here. Like it's, it's the version of a tension disc like you have up here. And um, I, um, I, this used to always be very clear for me which one that you adjust to make it tighter. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's this one, but I have to say, I'm going to say you should check that out. But I'm pretty sure it's this one because this one right here is mounting it to the bobbin case and your case may look a little different. All right, lastly, I wanna show you that inside here is this little spring. You see this little spring in here? It's this very thin piece of metal. I don't know if you can see this bluish piece of metal. I don't wanna poke at mine too much. Um, if yours is missing that, <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> I've gone through lots of those. Um, they aren't that critical. They are, I'm sure someone would say they are, but I will show you what my mechanic has done. All right, so welcome to my bag of every part I have ever needed or gone through um, with most of my industrial machines. <laughs> so um, I don't know why I keep this. I just think it's kind of funny. And the mechanic doesn't throw it away. He just gives it to me. So I figure maybe I'm supposed to keep it. Yeah, I know. I probably don't need to. But there is, you know, this is, a, this is what your bobbin case looks like under there in the machine. You can see this is the moving part. And this is what, this is the hook that they talk about in here. I mean, this is the hook actually. And so you're, you know, this is what's moving your bobbin around for the sewing. Um, I don't really know the details of this. I'm sure someone's laughing in the comments at me. Uh, it's just been a while since I understood this and I don't think about it anymore. But this is a bobbin case right here. So that's what your bobbin is going into. All right, so there, you know, the bobbin is in there. That's what is you're doing underneath the machine when it's um, when you're switching out your bobbin and you will get really good at this. This is what it looks like. All right, so speaking about bobbins, you can see this one right here has this little blue disc inside there. It's right here. This is a little tension spring or a spring. And you can see um, it, would, it would pop out really easily. See, I can move it around in there. So I've lost plenty of these. They just, I don't know where they go. Sometimes you lose them. And this is what my mechanic has done. So if you've lost yours, um, you might just do this. This is a little piece of bias binding. He just cut it off the roll of binding that was sitting on my machine at the time. You know, 
cut a little hole and trimmed it to fit. You can see it's kind of saturated with oil from over time. And that works great. And I definitely would notice if it didn't have that. So I think it's just kind of helped keep the bobbin not sticking to the back of the bobbin case and it kind of keeps it floating in there. So it just kind of keeps it floating in there and um, I really don't know the technical part about it, but it works. Uh, I've definitely seen crazier things on the production floor on how they MacGyver their way through getting their machines to work every day. Okay, so here is probably the funniest of my collection of things. Here's another one. So let's talk about your throat plate. <laughs> I have plenty. Uh, this isn't all the throat plates I've ever had. I definitely have gone through my fair share of throat plates and it's because I sewed such heavy duty things. And uh, what would happen is maybe say I would hit something kind of wrong and the needle would bend um, or just even just slightly bend and nick the hole here, you know, where the needle is passing through. And you can see it gets a little chewed up over time. This is my favorite one because it's green and love it. It was really sad to see it go. I also really love it when the numbers are engraved into the surface. This one might be a Teflon uh, plate, but I'm not sure. I can't really remember, but it could be. Um, I have definitely not noticed as much of a difference with a Teflon plate as I do a Teflon foot if you're sewing things like vinyl and sticky fabrics. Uh, that is just dependent upon what is coming in contact with your foot or your machine with the fabric. So it just depends on what you're sewing. And we were pretty strategic with how we sewed our things so that the machine, especially the presser foot, wasn't coming in contact with the vinyl. It, we would try and keep fabric in between, but there's definitely plenty of places where we just couldn't avoid it. But we felt the foot helped better than the plate. And that just depends. So here's all my throat plates. Um, and what happens is like, yeah, that probably looks good to you. You're like, what's wrong with that? So what? It has a few nicks in it. Well, the problem is your thread isn't staying perfectly centered into that hole going down in there. Remember your needles passing through too. So then, you know, the thread is against your needle. It's going through this hole. It might rub up against the side here, which has burrs. And then your thread starts breaking all the time. And you're like, why is my thread breaking? Now this can happen anywhere in your machine where there's friction and moving parts. And anytime that you're sewing along and you bend your needle, your bend, needle bends, maybe you don't even know what happened, and it, you're sewing on a needle for a while that's just so ever so slightly bent and you can't tell, what's happening is you're rubbing somewhere on your machine and that is eventually causing a burr. And it's probably also contributing to the timing getting off so these are the kinds of things you really need to pay attention to. So change your needle out, especially if you're sewing really thick things that can maybe, you know, move your needle around. This is a size 16 needle. You, I definitely sew probably on a heavier needle than most folks pretty consistently. And I will admit it's mainly because it's what I have so many of right now. If I were doing a pretty lightweight project, I would definitely go down to a 14. And you can have your machine set up for your style of sewing and what needle size works for you. All right, see so what else? I have other kinds of things in here. Oh, so this is what, um, your machine probably has this needle guard, finger guard on it. And um, <laughs> it's supposed to, they are not allowed to let you take the machine without it. Um, but we're just not gonna talk about the fact that I had mine removed, all right? <laughs> I can't handle it. I do not like using the, a foot with this. Um, so, you can see mine's gone, but you know, you only sew your finger once, right? <laughs> that's all it takes. Uh, that's another bobbin case. So and there's a few fuses in there. You, you know, it's just kind of a random assortment of stuff. So let's put these away here. And we're definitely gonna talk about what's under the machine as well. All right, so let's continue on. All right, so let's, let's talk a little bit about what's at the top here. This right here is gonna regulate the pressure of your presser foot. And um, you'll hear me talk about this a lot, that I really like a firm pressure. And that just for me helps me because I tend to be a polar and my hands are very strong. Um, I've been sewing a really long time and I've been sewing heavy duty stuff for a really long time. And so I tend to I could pull it right out from underneath the needle so easily on a home machine. And so I love having this pressure 
and you can dial it back, you know, so this little screw just prote protects it from going any further down from where you placed it. So, you know, if you want, you know, it's lefty loosey, righty tighty. So if you want less pressure, more pressure. And then once you got it where you want, just slide that down. Yours might look a little different. This right here, this little button is the thread swipe that we were, ta I was talking about earlier. Um, and so right, my, right now, the left side for me is depressed. You probably can't tell, let's see there. And what happens, I'll show you. Okay, so um, what happens, um, let me turn my machine on here. When I sew, this is what happens, this is very standard for when I sew. Right, I don't have the back tack on, you can see I have a long tail there. And see that's, I just threaded it. So that's my initial sewing right there. So if I turn on this little button up here at the top, or maybe I'm turning it off, <laughs> watch this little lever here. Here it comes. It's really quick. And so I actually don't notice the difference for me. I know that this is important for some functions, uh, but I don't need it. Um, and I've definitely been snapped by it with my finger. It's going pretty far. So there you go. I keep mine off. Okay, so once you have your bobbin in the machine and you've got your thread in there, you do not need to use your hand wheel to turn it towards you to pull up the bobbin thread. You just need to sew. And I always have a chunk of fabric to the right, right of my machine. This one I need to replace probably because it's pretty thready and I really like being able to see where I just sewed. So sometimes I'll sew it and I'll hold you know, where I just sewed so I can see what it looks like on the back and make sure everything is cool. So. Um, this is really handy. I always have something like this next to my machine on the right hand side and I'll stop everything to go find it. So all the tools I have, I usually have scissors, my awl, my seam ripper, a slightly larger pair of scissors, and this. I never mentioned this, but this is actually really important to me. <laughs> all right, so just make sure that it, you don't have to do a little test sew after you've changed your bobbin, but if you don't, you might have a little bit of thread, what I like to call thread vomit back there. Um, and if you switched your stitching or your bobbin while you were stitching something and maybe it's a visible area, you may not like the results on the underside. So your machine may do a nicer job. All right, so let's move on here to the other side of the machine here. All right, so this is my electronics panel because I do have the machine with the electronics and that's why I'm able to do the um, automatic back tack, thread clip, and a few other things. Um, and I forgot to mention that this right here is my back tack because of I have the electronics. So when I'm sewing along here, I'll show you the difference. So when I'm sewing along, this is one thing people on the stream can't see no matter how I have the camera. So if I want to back stitch real quick, that's what it is. That's that noise you guys are hearing. And then when I press back on my heels, it lifts the presser foot up, lifts the needle up, and clips the thread so I can remove it. All right, so if you don't have a machine with electronics, here is your back stitch, right? You know that now. Um, um, but that, and if you have this little doohickey on your machine, but it doesn't work, it's just because your machine doesn't have the electronics. That's all. So this is the the stitch length. It's the only dial you get. <laughs> and then up here, we have the electronics panel. And some of these look different than others. These are just decorations. The decal are just decorations. Um, a lot of people ask me what these are. They are just my love of watermelon, that's all. Right here is this little portal to your oil sole. Uh, it, it's very tempting to want to look at that while you're sewing. And let's see if we can get it on camera. Because um, I never look at it while I'm sewing. Let's see. I think I have to go pretty fast. I don't have enough fabric. 
it's probably going to be really hard to see that because I have the the camera mounted to the machine right now, so you have a front view. Um, putting cameras and sewing machines just doesn't really mix. So, if you have enough oil in your machine, theoretically, you might be able to see it bubbling up in there while you sew. Don't look at it while you're sewing, though. I'm able to at least look at the computer screen while I was trying that out. And I'm definitely going to show you how to put oil in the machine and uh, fill up that pan and all that. So it's pretty easy. Okay, so back to this electronics panel. My little thing here says CP18. I think that that is um, the model number of it. So I ended up trying to find out a little bit more about some of the other electronics panels before this video. And whoever was been like asking me to make this video, you're right, there's just not enough on the internet about it. But I did find the manual and I'm linking it in the description and I learned a lot from that manual and now I kinda wanna play around with this. So this is my automatic back tack. If I turn that on, my machine, when I start, is gonna be the A, the B. It's going to go three stitches forward, three stitches back, and then wait for me to sew that just stops. So if I turn that on right now, you're going to hear it and the machine, the camera's going to move, sorry. So now it's waiting for me to go. I'm going to keep sewing. And now when I press back on my heel, it's going to do the CD. Three stitches forward, three stitches back. And you can change any of these to be whatever you want. So let's see, let's watch that. That's how it works. All right, so these do different things. So some of these buttons on some of the electronics panel, not mine, um, you can set this up to actually sew uh, maybe in a square, like around a label. So maybe you're, uh, you're going to do a lot of that. You can get that kind of set up. There, are, all these things do a little bit different things and I learned so much um, and I'm kind of excited to check one of the features out because I thought it was kind of intriguing and I encourage you just to just to open up your manual if you have it or check it out in the description um, and kind of get get to pages like I want to say like 14 15 and then the, and then the mid 20s and you're gonna see what I mean there's a lot of different things you can do and I would just say experiment you know, I don't think you can hurt anything. Um, and, you know, let's see what this one does. All right, so um, we'll try this one right here. I'm gonna hold the camera so it doesn't vibrate. Here we go. So it just did its kind of its version of a back tack there. Now see, I don't need to do this over and over or very fast. Uh, when I need back tacks, I can just use my back stitch, it's fine. But we all know that there's an infinite number of things in the world to sew. We've all seen the um, things on the shelf at the ready to wear and we go, hmm, I wonder how they did that. Well, there's an infinite number of machines and configurations. I, I know of places that build machines, customize machines. I know of people who've just done it on the fly. Uh, it's not taboo. It's definitely something you can do and you can have any attachment made that you want. Um, that's not standard. It may cost you a couple hundred bucks, but it'll definitely, if you need it, um, it'll make your life easier. So I would check out the, the instruction manual for that. I rarely ever use my back tack unless I'm doing some very specific step over and over again. And then I put it on. So, okay, let's see what else here. So here's your hand wheel and there's a red and a green dot in there. Um, and you can learn more about that in the manual. I never worry about it. Let's see. It, but it is just the lining up of how your hand wheel is and everything. And everything's kosher. Okay, so let's talk about the foot pedal down here. Okay, so here is my foot pedal. Yes, my floor is pretty dirty. Um, and I recommend that you use both of your feet when you're first learning to sew on the production machine. And you can see I'm tilting my heels back and forth. And so when I tilt them back, that is raising my presser foot. Let's see if I can show you. I don't know if I can, honestly. So when I raise, let's see. It's kind of hard. 
hard to get it all in there. Uh, so that is what is happening. And um, if you have a heel lift machine, it'll do something similar. It's just not quite the most identical function as what mine looks like. So when I'm you know, going forward, I don't have the automatic back tack on, so I'm just sewing. But then when I stop, my needle is down, my presser foot is down. Now when I kick with my heels, it cuts the thread, raises the presser foot and the needle, and now it's waiting for me to keep sewing again. It's very subtle. Um, I think some may wonder why this is so helpful to someone, but it's such a, a more ergonomic thing than using a knee lift for me. I really like the heel lift and I find it a little speedier. So, but I used a knee lift for ages. <laughs> okay, so I think we've covered everything um, on the machine. Let's see here. Okay, so we've covered just about everything up top except one last thing here. That spool, the spindle right here. See that? So there is this peg back there. This right here. And that is for your machine head when you tilt it back to rest against it. So it has a place to go. Um, and I also, like many other sewists, use it to hold binding or um, a roll of elastic or something because it kind of keeps it out of the way and it keeps the roll from sliding off my table. Now this right here is a part of a yarn ball holder contraption that this nice gentleman gave me at a show. I never used it to hold my ball of yarn, but I did use it for all kinds of other things like holding twine and cutting things for hang tags. Um, but this, it kind of just struck me because one day our spools came back from the binding maker. They were so large. They were like this big around. I still have one, one or two of them. And they would rub against the cords back here. And so by putting this on the spindle, it raised up the bias roll and gave it more clearance and let it move more freely. Plus this thing just kind of tends to spin. <laughs> I have a friend who actually makes things now just for this purpose because she, she understands the struggle of it as well. So um, that was pretty funny. It's a very useful thing to us and I couldn't live without it for a while there when we changed binding manufacturers and they gave us these gigantic spools. And then finally I could say, hey, can you just not make the spools bigger than a certain diameter and they were like sure no problem and they did so I'm going to show you how to remove this on my other machine because I'm having trouble getting mine open since I got it and um, the other the only other things I do is I do use compressed air to clean things out so sometimes I'll you know, clean between my tension discs I try and keep it pretty dust free I try and get under this little thing right here. Oops, there goes my straw. And so one of the things that I notice is when I haven't sewn on my machine, even for a few days, there tends to be a little bit more oil down here. And um, just have a cloth handy to clean it up because it, it, if you touch it, your fabric to this, you might get a little bit on your fabric. I never had this issue when um, I had the factory because I sewed so much that it just wasn't um, something that I encountered. So don't, don't um, just check it before you start sewing. Now if you change your needle, this is the screw right here to change your needle. And when you put in your needle, so I, um, I'm not like, you know, devoted to one brand or another. Um, it just depends on who has needles. <laughs> So I've used both these Gross Beckert and the Oregon needles, and um, these are pretty nifty packages, you know, because there's just like two per little pocket there, and they snap together. And I would just buy them by a Gross because we went through so many. I have so many needles now, probably much for the rest of my life if I never have a factory again. So um, the thing you need to know 
is that the needle front that you're going to thread the thread into first is the side with the long groove, just like in a home sewing machine. That groove right there is to help guide the thread into the eye of the needle. And see the back has this little carved out part of the shank and the shank is smooth. So this groove, so this needle, this is the front of the needle right here, faces that way on my machine just like that and I thread it left to right. Okay, I keep coming up with things to add to this video. And one thing that I know I would have found really helpful was under, understanding the needle packet. Now, I don't know all of these things on here, but I'm gonna tell you the really important things are this right here, the 16 by number is uh, the length of the needle. And both of these are fine. And then right here, you're probably more familiar with the um, size of the needle so you have 90 slash 14 and in the united states we always say 14 um, and in other places of the world they usually use the 90 and on here that is right it's so tiny right here so this one says 100 slash 16. so um i really wanted to say this mainly because we use size 16 needles and it's very confusing when you have this number here that is not the size of the needle as far as what you're used to thinking of that this is right here so you can tell that they don't value this number as much as a sewist does <laughs> it's they value more of this on the packaging so just remember um, to double check the sizing of the needle if you're unclear if you're buying this and you're in person this is what the organ needle packet look like they're really cute they look like um, they look like a package of uh, gum in there so keep it away from your kids. <laughs> They're a little fiddly, but great needles both. So, um, and then these are the ones with the little pocket. It's kind of a shame that these little plastic containers are just single use, but they are really nice for keeping the, the um, needles nice. And in all the years and the thousands of needles I've used, I've had one bad needle ever. So it's pretty good. And I don't even know which brand it was. So. Like I said, this uh, 257, 231, I feel like 257 is the one I see the most on my, for my machine. Um, I also see this DB1 on both packages. I'm sorry, I don't remember what that is. Same with the 1738. So, um, and see this, this is the other thing, this 10 right here, this is probably the quantity of needles in this package. But it looks like it's the needle size. Because as a sewist, you're looking for this two digit number that's anywhere between, you know, 12 and 18 usually. So just make sure you're looking at the proper one. It's usually going to be accompanied by a slash. So you have the 90 slash 14 or the 100 slash 16. So I know that that would have been helpful for me. All right, that's it. So um, if you're having trouble, like you're kind of new to using your industrial, and you're having trouble with your um, thread or your tension or something's just really funky, make sure that that's correct because I know that when um, I've switched machines that have different threading styles, I accidentally will put my needle in the way my old machine did. So just check that. Uh, if you're ever having trouble with your stitches and your tension and things like that, re-thread the machine from scratch. Just take it all out. <laughs> it's not that hard. I just showed you, you know, you're just going through these little spaces. It's the only thing you make sure you get really, you know, pay attention to. But if you are just changing colors and everything's going good, you can just do what you do on your serger. If you have one, you can just cut the thread, right? And then tie it off, tie it off. Make sure you tie it off tight. So make sure you tie it off tight. Whoops, that's kind of a big knot. You don't want a huge knot. I'm trying to look at the camera. Because you need it to go through, be able to go through the discs down here. So just make sure it doesn't fall apart. Sometimes I don't tie it tight enough and then it falls apart. And so now I'm just going to pull it. I lift up my presser foot. Lift up my presser foot and then I pull. You can see here comes my knot. There it is right there. And it just goes all the way through. You have to unthread the needle to do that, just like anything. And then you need to just re-thread your needle. And then you're set. 
So if you're just changing color, you know, that's fine. It's totally fine. But if you're having some issues with your tension, uh, make sure you unthread the whole thing. I'll thread that later. Uh, that, let's see, change your needle often. And if you are having to change it really often because you feel that there's like a burr on your needle every time you change it, you should probably get your, your machine checked out. It may need um, some tuning up under there. Let's look inside here. So you can see I have this bottle of oil here. You want to make sure you always use the right oil on your machine. Make sure it's the right oil, okay? You can't just use oil that's out in the garage for um, the weed whacker. You know, you really need to make sure you're getting the correct oil for your sewing machine. And you need to make sure your pan, so this sits in a pan of oil. Let's see if I can open this up here. Ooh, gooey. All right, so the thing I want to tell you about, so yeah, here is some uh, fuzz and oil. This right here, you probably can't see, but do you see this? Um, let's see if I can get my pointer. This right here, this is the edge of the pan. So the pan is over here. This right here is under your bobbin case. Um, I have never cleaned that out. Uh, if you don't want to be grossed out, just don't look. It's okay, but you'll definitely see in here some um, burrs sometimes. Like I've seen my mechanic find things in there broken pieces of needle and whatever. Uh, the oil's definitely dripping into there. It's a catch mint. So that's all that is just for fuzzies and stuff. So in here pan, just all I did was push this back. There is a high and a low mark on the back there. So this thing right here, it says high and low, and you need your oil to be between those two marks. And you need it to be pretty clear. It's a little yellow, that's okay. But just make sure you're between those two marks and then um, you can pour some oil in there. And so let's see if we can move the thread cradle out of the way. There we go. That's better. So now I'm resting on that spool back there that I, re I put my, um, uh, my binding on. <laughs> All right, and so this right here is a wick. Don't touch that. That's wicking up the oil into the machine. Everything looks really good in here, but I'm going to add a little bit because I'm just above the low mark. I'll just go in between there. Okay, this thing kind of, I don't know, it kind of sweats oil, so <laughs> keep it somewhere you don't mind. All right, so this looks pretty good. Yeah, this is all fuzzy and dirty. I'm, that's not in here, it's fine. So now, say you are moving. I'm sorry to hear that, unless it's to your brand new, shiny, amazing studio. And uh, you need to move your industrial machines. So your oil pan has suddenly become the bane of your existence, but don't fret. So just do it methodically. You're gonna need a funnel, a jar, and a screwdriver. And so down here, right here, there is a big screw. It's about the size of a nickel. It's a flat head. Um, so you're gonna need a pretty wide flat head screwdriver. And it's a very shallow screw if, from what I can remember. Wait, can I feel it? I'm pretty sure. This one feels a little different. Um, and then once you unscrew that, all of your oil will drain through a hole at the bottom into into the jar. I also like to have like a little plastic trash can and I set the jar under in the trash can while I'm doing all of this because you know I'm usually renting somewhere or oil can be super dangerous to slip on if you don't have something that's going to catch it. So uh, be really careful about that. And then you can reuse that oil. It's totally fine to pour right back into your machine. So if you're going a short distance, oh, I can see a pin back here. If you're going a short distance in your move, then you might be able to move your machine without emptying the oil pan. I've done that many times, but you need to make sure the machine stays level while it's being moved. And that is no easy task. So 
moving your machine and keeping it level, it's quite a beast. And the irony is when you're lifting up this table and moving it, the heavy end over here where the motor is, then your knees can't go under the table while you're holding the end of the table because the motor goes all the way up to the edge. The light end has room for the knees to go under and you'll know exactly what I mean if you ever do this. So um, you need a couple of strong people. Uh, the other clever thing I've done is I will put one end of my machine, the legs, on a piece of cardboard or a rug and then pull it around like that. I lift up the heavy end and kind of use it almost like picture a wheelbarrow. And so I put the um, heavy or the light end of my machine on a rug and then I lift up the heavy end and I kind of slide it around my office. And there's really clever dollies made for that, uh, but I think they're usually homemade in factories. That's the only ones I've ever seen. And it looks like a little L of metal that the lip of your legs fit into with two wheels on it. And then you can lift up your machine and move it around like a wheelbarrow. So there you go. There's your next million dollar invention. If you ever need to move your hand wheel, that's fine. You know, it's right here. Just like you do with other sewing projects, it's fine to move your hand wheel on your industrial. Um, let's see. Just move it towards you. That's, that's the best. Now, say you need to remove the head of your machine from the table. You need to take it into the mechanic. He won't come out to you. Uh, I've done that before with the machine with electronics. I was totally afraid as well, but it ended up going really, really well. It wasn't that bad. Be very methodical, take lots of pictures, but it's really not that bad. And you just need to carry the head of your machine, which is this, to the mechanic. Now, if the motor needs servicing, that's a completely different thing, but de generally, your motor's never, ne never going to need servicing. It's just the head of the machine. You can bring it to them. They'll plop it into another table with a motor, and they will be able to fix it. And just try and call ahead and see if they can do it while you're there uh, so you don't have unless it, unless it's close by. Okay, so let's talk about the bobbin winder. Um, this is such a great tool, so it does mean you need a lot of bobbins, but if you're sewing the same color thread often. It's great to have two bobbins of the same color so that you're sewing with one and winding the other at the same time. And the winding takes very little time. It's just nice um, not to have to run the bobbin winder when you're having to do it all by itself and you'll see why. Because right now, like I can see, this bobbin isn't done winding yet. You can see in the front there. So in order to finish that, if I'm not sewing, I actually need to sew on my sewing machine, run it without fabric in there, and I have to unthread the needle. You have to unthread the needle. So if you're going to thread or uh, wind a bobbin without sewing at the same time, unthread the needle. I like to hold the thread so that it doesn't... I hold the thread and then I sew. And you can see. See, so th this, is a, this is a pretty cumbersome way to wind your bobbin. It's not very efficient. And it's also a little, I just don't feel really uncomfortable running my machine with nothing in it, even if I'm holding the thread. Plus, it's putting a lot of wear on your um, presser foot with the feed dogs. I don't know. All right, so now it's done. And so now let's talk about how to put one on here. All right, so I usually sew a lot in cream. So you'll see I always have a cream bobbin going at the same time as I'm using one. And there's usually a full bobbin just sitting there waiting for me. And it really doesn't take long. You know, it usually takes like three or four seams and your bobbin is full. So it's just good to just set it up. Okay, so here's an empty bobbin. I'm going to put it on here. And now let me tell you a little bit about this. See this prong right here and how that there's a space in between? Now, if your bobbin is too hard to get on there or too easy to pull off, like it's not staying on there, because if it's not, um, if this isn't open enough, what'll happen is your bobbin won't spin. It's holding the bobbin onto 
the machine, and this right here is what's going to rotate. So if this isn't tight enough and holding your bobbin on there, it's not going to rotate enough and it's not going to get wound. All right, so. All right, so you know how to throw, so you, you know how to thread your thread through the cradle above, so front or back to front. And now when you come down here, you're gonna go through this top hole here. Um, that's a huge hole, come on, go through there. There we go. And then you're gonna go through the tension disc and look, I'm holding this to give it tension while it's in there so it's, it's really firm in there. And now pull, pull and make sure it doesn't get, you know, looped up because it could have done this. That's a problem, right? So you make sure it's running nice and free through there. And I just do this like this. I just go from under the bobbin and around and just wind it a bunch right on top of itself. Yes, you can go through the hole and do all that too, but I just don't. And then make sure you push this. And also make sure that this little tail doesn't create a loop and get stuck around this little arm because it just won't wind it'll just be stuck around it all right and so now you're ready to sew now you just go sew like normal and your bobbin will be winding as you go and that's all it takes now you can adjust the tension of how the bobbin is the thread is on the bobbin but what you want is something nice and firm now this could be a little firmer you see I can kind of push into it a little bit I don't know if you can really see that but if your bobbin is really soft, you see, look right there, it's kind of gushy. Maybe you can see better with the awl. If your bobbin's gushy on any machine, it's going to be a problem. It needs to be firm on there. You don't want it too tight because it's stretching out your thread, but you do want it to be pretty firm on there so that it's giving, it's also a form of tension for your lower thread. So if it's too loose, it's not good. It's too loose, it's not going to sew very well. And that goes for any machine. So when I first got my machine, mine weren't very tight and this was too tight. And so I had to make a few adjustments. I think they just forgot to set it up for me, but I was able to do that. And the other part of you wanting it to be firm on there is it'll hold more thread, which is always good, right? Cause see, see, this isn't even filling up as much as it could. I could probably adjust this little arm so that when it's full, it's maybe stopping right here. And I would probably do that, I'm pretty sure, with this screw right here. Let's see. So I want it, or maybe it's this right here, I would want to adjust this. Well, you could look into that, I'm not sure. Um, but my old bobbin winder used to fill up even more than this. You really notice that little bit when it, you're losing out on a few yards of thread. Okay, so this uh, was my previous um, industrial machine that I used for years. I bought it for $300, best $300 I've ever spent. Um, it did have electronics until the motor blew up. I talk a lot about this machine in the video where I, can, I race the home sewing machine, the industrial without electronics, and the industrial with electronics against each other, sewing notions cases. And you can kind of see a, a little bit of the nitty gritty of what distinguishes with and without electronics. So this one doesn't have that anymore. Um, so you can just check that video out since this one's gonna be so long. But if you don't have a machine with electronics, that's totally fine. You don't need one um, and uh, they work really great. So on this machine, I can't use this anymore, but I can use this. This is my back stitch on this machine. It has a knee lift and it always has, even when it had the electronics, it has a knee lift. And so it didn't act the same as the heel lift. The heel lift is far more convenient and a lot more ergonomic for me. Okay, so one of the big things I wanna show you to do for maintaining your machine is to remove the throat plate and to clean it out. Now, I don't know who slides this door open except my mechanic, so I can't even get it open unless my machine's up. He does, I don't, um, and I don't need to. But if you, so remember you can really raise your presser foot with the thing at the back. And this has that oil I was telling you about because it hasn't been used much. So this is a really tricky area to get into and my mechanic was kind enough to give me this one time. So it's a little tiny screwdriver, but it has this divot on the top so that when you put it in there, you can hold it down and you're able to unscrew the throat plate. This throat plate, 
has two different types of screws in it, which I'm not surprised. Okay, so just remove it. Do not drop those screws, okay? Be really careful because if they fall into the pan of oil, you're gonna probably say a few beep, beep, beeps. You know what I mean, jelly beans. All right, so let's get this open. After a while, I can just use my finger so I actually pull the screws away. I have dropped a screw in there before, and I did say a few beep, beep, beeps. Okay, so I'm going to um, move all these little things away <laughs> from this. And now um, I just need something to kind of lift this up just like that, all right? And so I barely use this machine since I kind of decommissioned it. It's not truly de decommissioned. Should have a cloth handy. Um, it's not truly decommissioned, uh, but I just don't use it anymore. It's totally functional. It's still a really great machine. But there's still a lot of fuzzies in there if you can see these in here. No. Okay, so uh, I've got the zoom in on there and the focus on there. And so you can see there's a lot of fuzzies in here. Still see all this? And so you're gonna want to use a little brush um, and get rid of these, this stuff and make sure that you're protecting your surfaces from the oil and stuff that you're going to pull out of there because all this stuff's pretty oily. Um, and then once you kind of get a lot of that big stuff out of there, you can use a little bit of the compressed air. I don't usually use my all. I wasn't really planning on doing this, so let's see. I just like to get all this stuff. So if you haven't done this and you've had your machine and you've sewn a lot on it, you're gonna have a field day. You're gonna be like, ooh, goody. This is gonna be really fun. Uh, I always like cleaning this out. So try and go away from the machine too. And remember, some of this might go on the floor. So be careful. So another thing you can do Get a few different angles, by the way. I always bend my straw and push it into the air. Um, you can rotate this a little bit. Rotate your, uh, you know, your hand wheel and get a different angle. If you have tweezers, I fully recommend using tweezers. It's pretty handy. All right, so just make sure that you clean that once in a while. You don't have to do it every time you change your thread like I said to do with your bobbin, but you're gonna wanna do it um, regularly. Maybe when you're just getting having a bad sewing day and you just kind of need to reset, that's a really good time to do it. Unless you're mad. <laughs> Alright, and then put your screws back in, don't over tighten them, and then you're set to go. Okay, I, like I said, I keep coming up with things that I really want to be able to include in this video. I feel like I'm going to forget this major thing that is so obvious to mention. But one, of the thing I want to, one thing I want to cover is when you're going to buy a machine, I know that um, you feel a little overwhelmed because there's so many different styles. And maybe you're like, I'm going to get that one because I know that person likes it. So I highly, 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 highly recommend I cannot recommend this enough. And I would never go buy a machine without doing this. Bring the things you sew with you. Bring your scissors, bring your seam ripper, and bring a project. Even if you're just gonna bring the materials that you sew, uh, just please do that. They should let you use the machine. And if you're buying this like uh, online and you're, it's gonna be shipped to you, that's a little trickier, so you need to talk to them and say specifically, these are the things I'm sewing, this is what they look like, because um, that makes a big difference. So when I went and bought this machine, even though it's exactly the same as my old machine, just a new version of it, I still brought my toughest thing to sew, which was the pocket bucket. It has stiffener, binding, fabric, and vinyl. And, um, and it was so great to try and use the machine. And so the mechanic would come over and say, okay, how's it going? And I could say, okay, can I adjust this? Yep, we can adjust that. And so we could see, now they wouldn't just fine tune it to my sewing right there before I bought it, but he was like, yeah, that can be adjusted. You know, yeah, we can work on that. And it was really, really helpful. And um, the other thing you want to think about is that maybe this kind of machine isn't right for what you're doing. 
So the other two options that I looked at was a needle feed and a walking foot. And they were just a little bit overkill for what I needed. And there are other machines out there. There's plenty of other machines out there, but they might take six months to get because they're coming from Japan and then they sit in Florida for a really long time and I'm on the West Coast. I highly recommend buying a machine used. I've bought plenty of machines used and it went really well. So just make sure that you, if you don't get to try it out, you see them sew it. FaceTime them, do a video, whatever it takes because you really wanna make sure that it's going to sew, you know, and it, it works well, right? If you're doing this on like Craigslist or eBay or something like that, I don't really know what to say. I know it's really tough to find a machine sometimes and you gotta do what you gotta do, right? So um, always bring your materials with you and ask them, what would you recommend? And ask them why, because sometimes they may have a machine they really would like to find a good home for and so it would make space for something else they know they can sell easier, right? You're a little worried about that to begin with, but at the same time, you they don't want to sell something to someone who's gonna become their biggest headache. <laughs> they really want you to be successful, and I, I actually trust um, the place I buy machines at a lot, and um, I drive an hour, almost an hour and a half to go do that. So I really trust them. And then their mechanic comes to me, but it does cost a bit to do that. So um, make sure you bring your materials, bring your tools, bring your materials, test it out and think about it, you know? So um, I don't know what else I have to add to that, but I hope that helps and I can't stress that enough. You know, if you're sewing lingerie and really slippery fabrics, um, this machine can be calibrated for that, but maybe there's something even better out there for that. If you're going to be doing just a lot of bar tacking and industrial, um, really heavy duty industrial stuff, you might want a completely different machine. And maybe buying used machines and trying them out because they're so much more affordable will give you the opportunity to at least figure out what you don't want or what you don't need. And that is really helpful. I paid um, pretty sure $1,800 for this machine, brand new with the electronics, um, and that was delivered. And I paid $800 for my um, other machine that used to have electronics. And I paid $300, actually I paid $300 for the one that um, you see in the video where I do show you the oil. I paid 300 bucks to a friend, he needed to get rid of it. It was an amazing machine for that amount of money and that one's that model's pretty sought after so I got really lucky. But like I said, there's plenty of people that just want the space, they don't know what to do with it, They maybe they inherited this storage unit with machines in it. So, and I've had friends, I've converted plenty of sewists, actual competitors of mine in um, bag making. And I say, you need to get an industrial machine and they all bought them used and they've had uh, really great success stories with that. This is the first time I ever bought a brand new machine and it's pretty much because it's getting really hard to find that one uh, used because they're so old. So, all right, good luck and hang tough, get what you want and what you need. Um, and you know what? See if you can return it if it doesn't work out. I've done that before too. I know, you don't wanna have to do that and it's a pain, but you wanna be happy and you wanna use your machine. Good luck. All right, well that's my video today. I hope this helped a few of you out. Let me know if I missed anything and um, what was the one thing that you learned today? Because I know that I there was a quite a few things that took me a while to get the hang of and get the confidence to do when I got my industrials. I really just didn't wanna mess anything up. But trust me, it's a very, very resilient and simple machine. So just be careful and make sure that you um, don't touch that foot pedal if the machine's on and you're not ready for it, all right? So let me know and I hope to see you another time.